Mackinac in Chapel at San Francisco de Sisi confirms Mary Mackinac as one of the most important late medieval states. The Mackinac Chapel is located at one of the principal religious and artistic sites of the 13th and 14th centuries, the Double Church of San Francisco. The Lower Church, begun in 1228, immediately following the canonization of St. Francis, initially comprised an entry porch, nave, and transept in blue on the plan, with a high altar located directly over Francis's tomb. The upper church followed, rising above the same footprint, its walls covered over the course of the later Dugento uh, with frescoes by the leading Italian masters in Rome and Florence, Cimabue, Jacopo Turiti, Pietro Cavallini, and recent evidence supports the young Giotto. Then, beginning after 1288, the lower church was expanded in an effort to increase access for the overwhelming numbers of pilgrims visiting St. Francis's tomb. Donnell Cooper and Janet Robeson have proposed the Magdalene Chapel, added during this expansion, played a significant role. It may have both served as a confessional and held masses for pilgrims prior to their entering the transept and circulating to the tomb itself. So they proposed pilgrims either came down the nave into the chapel and then into the transept, or perhaps circulated down the uh, row of chapels into that area. I too believe the Magdalene Chapel's themes and functions extend well beyond simply representing this important saint's vita within its four walls and respond to the larger Franciscan environment and culture of pilgrimage. But my paper focuses on the Magdalene's body. It, through its dress, hair, and postures, plays a significant role in the chapel and links her hagiography to Francis's. The church's imagery clearly uses Francis's dress, a term that for scholars includes clothing, accessories, hair, and even the state of undress, to show his adherence to poverty, charity, and penance. Yet it has remained largely unremarked that the Magdalene Chapel includes innovative and perhaps unique images that similarly display those virtues using dress. For example, the Magdalene's garb alters in coloration from red to pale red to white, visibly marking her progress into an increasingly holy state of purity. Further, while the Magdalene powerfully models redemption at San Francesco, she accomplishes this paradoxically by assuming the roles of egregious sinner and pitiful petitioner. She appears repeatedly in narratives not only with a dangerously eroticized body, but also with a pitifully needy one. We'll see again and again that she kneels as the suppliant, pleading for forgiveness and assistance, her postures passive rather than active. These expressions of what were traditionally seen as stereotypical female carnality and weaknesses, however, ultimately reinforce her reputation as consummate intercessor. For pilgrims visiting the site, themselves confessing, petitioning for mercy, and hoping for redemption, um, they would witness her appeals consistently and affirmatively answered. If even she, a prostitute, could convince Christ to resurrect her brother Lazarus and be saved herself, she offered hope to all sinners. The Magdalene Chapel's pictorial cycles are both extensive and of high quality. While its authorship and dating have been much debated, scholarly opinion favors attributing the frescoes to Giotto and or Giotto's workshop and dates them between 1305 and 1319, possibly to 1305 to 1308. Covering all four walls and the vault, the chapel's decoration includes frescoes of seven narratives from Mary Magdalene's life. You see, three here, three here, and the seventh one there. Seventeen standing saints, plus numerous half-length saints, 
angels, and holy figures. The stained glass windows on the north wall from about 1300 to 1305 immediately preceded the frescoes and include an additional 11 scenes from the Magdalene's Vita, accompanied by five standing saints, including Christ, the Virgin, and Mary Magdalene herself. Issues of patronage appear resolved and clarify the chapel fulfilled multiple purposes, for it also functioned as a funerary chapel for Assisi's Franciscan bishop, Teobaldo Montano. He appears twice within the frescoes, uh, the chapel's frescoes, once dressed in bishop's robes to St. Rufinus, patron saint and first bishop of Assisi, and once dressed as a Franciscan, kneeling alongside the Magdalene. While it remains possible the patron selected the chapel's subject matter, more likely the program was predetermined by the Franciscans as part of a larger iconographic whole. Thus, multiple scholars have considered parallels within San Francesco's upper and lower churches, <coughs> parallels between St. Francis's life and ideals and the Magdalene's. Most obviously, they explore shared themes of conversion, penance, and charity, the saints' similar preaching missions, and their commitment to both the active life and the contemplative life. My analysis of the Magdalene's dress and posture suggests that the saint plays yet additional roles at San Francesco, <coughs> a church whose imagery otherwise focuses only slight attention on female holy experience and female bodies. The Magdalene's eminent position in her own chapel remains exceptional and her imagery resonates throughout the double church, taking on broader significance than has heretofore been acknowledged. Most significant in terms of the Magdalene's dress is the fresco of a hermit priest giving a garment to the Magdalene. As many have noted, this episode is not found in the Magdalene's earliest written lives, but rather is almost certainly taken from Mary of Egypt's, one of the standing saints frescoed on the wall, window wall opposite. Mary of Egypt, after 47 years in the desert, was visited by the priest Zosimus. Like the Magdalene, Mary of Egypt is a former prostitute who grows miraculously long hair while in the wilderness. But instead of being shown as young and nude, as is most common for the Magdalene, appears as an elderly woman. Here at Assisi, she unusually is wrapped in a long white veil. The Magdalene's borrowed story of living naked in the wilderness, visited by a priest who covers her with a garment, is widespread in the Magdalene's written narratives already by the 11th century. Yet images of her receiving a garment never gained current currency, possibly due to texts like the 12th century Cistercian Vita, which denied the episode ever occurred and correctly recognized it as borrowed from tales of the Egyptian ascetic. Quote, but the rest of the tale that she saw no man afterwards until she was visited by I know not what priest for whom she begged a garment and other such stuff is false and a fabrication of storytellers drawn out of the accounts of the penitent of Egypt." End quote. Similarly, Jacopus da Voragine seems suspicious of the story in his enormously popular 13th century golden legend. There, in an afterthought to his standard account of the Magdalene's 30-year wilderness retirement, he refers only briefly to her receipt of a garment from a priest who, quote, found her closed up in a cell, not a cave. Nowhere does Jacobus mention her nudity or any miraculous growth of hair. While images of the Magdalene with long flowing hair at her wilderness cave abound in later medieval and Renaissance pictorial cycles, the early 14th century Assisi fresco is the earliest example, and in fact, the only pre-Counter-Reformation example known to me of a male holy figure offering the nude saint a garment. It may well be unique. 
rare precedents do exist of similar scenes, but like the borrowed garment story added to the Magdalene's Vitae, they occur in image cycles of Mary of Egypt. Two early 13th century French examples appear in stained glass window cycles at Chartres Cathedral and at Bourges. At Chartres, a new Mary of Egypt, with blonde hair to her ankles, kneels before Zosimus and clutches a garment to her. At Bourges, an extensive cycle comprising 30 panels of Mary of Egypt's life includes the naked saint accepting a shapeless garment from Zosimus while he warily turns away. <laughs> the Assisi Chapel's stained glass, which includes a remarkable 11 scene narrative of the Magdalene, beginning at the bottom of the rightmost lancet, down, whoops, sorry, uh, down here, and then moving upward, further compounds the slightly later fresco's unusual iconography by preceding it with an alternate version of the wilderness story and the Magdalene's receipt of clothing. This treatment is also the earliest I know and may similarly be unique. Three scenes in the left, excuse me, in the third lancet from the right depict her experience as a wilderness ascetic. These three right here. And each clearly asserts her identity with the label, Santa Maria Magdalena. In the first, here. In the first, she stands alone while dressed only in her long brownish blonde hair and raises her hands in prayer towards Christ in the adjacent lancet. Immediately below, in the second scene, the upper right, an angel, not a hermit priest, offers her a voluminous white garment. Below that, a hooded male figure stands behind the now covered saint while a lion <laughs> sits at her feet. This last certainly refers to her imminent death and burial and confirms its origins like those of the fresco cycles hermit priest giving a garment in the tales of Mary of Egypt, where Zosimus and a lion bury her. Mary of Egypt's stained glass window cycles at Chartres and Gorge Cathedral again offer the closest visual palaces that parallels to Assisi, especially the extensive Borge cycle. Like the Assisi glass, the Borge Magdalene first appears alone in the wilderness covered only by her hair, but after his gift of a cloak, excuse me, that should be, at, at, that's Mary uh, of Egypt in the Borge cycle, first appears alone in the wilderness covered only by her hair, but after his gift of a cloak, Zosimus returns to administer the Eucharist. Following Mary of Egypt's death and her soul's elevation into heaven, Zosimus finally shrouds her body and buries it with a lion's assistant. Thus, the first and last of Assisi's three wilderness scenes correspond narratively and thematically with Borges' Mary of Egypt panels, strongly suggesting such northern Vita disciples informed the Assisi artists. I believe images of St. Agnes of Rome influenced Assisi's Lancet with the Magdalene receiving the robe from an angel. This motif of an angel offering a naked, long-haired saint covering garment recalls the tale of Agnes, a third pursuit saint associated with prostitution. Indeed, scholars identify her as the source for the Magdalene's miraculous hair growth. Surprisingly, that miracle appears not in the Magdalene's written vitae or originally in Mary of Egypt's, but derives from Agnes's. As the Golden Legend re relates, because Agnes refuses to marry a pagan prefect's son, she is stripped of her clothing and sent to a brothel. God first miraculously grows her hair long to cover her nakedness. Then, inside the brothel, seen here, uh, an angel forms a, quote, shining mantle about her. 
What depictions of a naked Agnes receiving the mantle from an angel while covered only by her hair are not widespread. Images do exist. Here by Jean Poussel, or here in a stained glass lancet at Le Mans Cathedral, where Agnes' cycle appears directly adjacent to the lancet with Mary Magdalene's. The two saints appear in even closer proximity in Andrea Orcagna's small devotional triptych. Here, in the center, Agnes receives a garment from an angel, her shining mantle. At the left, an angel trailing a long white veil that covers its hands and shoulders offers Mary Magdalene an ampoule. Visually, the two hair-covered saints appear indistinguishable. Only their narrative circumstances differentiate them. The Magdalene kneels outside her cave, while St. Agnes receives her voluminous garment in the brothel. Thus, Agnes not only inspires the Magdalene's miraculous hair growth, but I believe her imagery motivated the unusual Assisi stained glass scene of the Magdalene receiving a white garment from an angel. And the specific labeling of these Magdalene scenes in the Assisi Lancet <coughs> confirm they do not result from any confusion by the artists, but were purposely appropriated from cycles of Mary of Egypt and Agnes and inserted into the Magdalene's. Possibly their designers recognized the need for identifying labels due to their appropriation. Such inscriptions do not appear on any of the other eight Magdalene narratives in the Assisi lances. But why would Assisi's Magdalene Chapel fresco and stained glass artists need to borrow scenes depicting the receipt of a garment from two different saints' iconographic traditions, scenes which remain rare or perhaps even unique within the Magdalene's pictorial tradition? I believe the explanation rests on the importance of San Francesco of issues surrounding dress. Bonaventure, in his Legenda Mayor, characterizes the episode of St. Francis offering his mantle to a poor knight, depicted in the upper church, first Naive Bay, as relating to charity and poverty, two primary Franciscan concerns. Francis, upon seeing a noble but impoverished knight, was motivated, quote, with such tender compassion that he immediately took off his garments and clothed him with them, so at, that at one and the same time he fulfilled a twofold service of love, and that he both concealed the shame of a noble knight and relieved the penury of a poor man, end quote. Joel Brink has recognized that fresco's resonance with Simone Martini's in the lower chapel, uh, lower churches, St. Martin Chapel, likely painted just a few years after the Magdalene Chapel. But what remains notable in both fresco and stained glass when the Magdalene receives a garment are the role reversals. Unlike the male saints, Francis and Martin, the Magdalene in both is the passive recipient of charity. She does not actively dispense it. While the vertical shape of the lancet discourages a horizontal scene, in the fresco she humbly kneels before the upright hermit. Although all three saints' narratives regarding the receipt of garments unify the upper and lower churches by clearly highlighting the Franciscan virtue of caritas, here we see her as the needy one, the passive recipient requ requiring assistance. The location of the hermit priest giving a garment to the Magdalene on the Magdalene Chapel's entry wall also reinforces its heightened significance. It appears on the outer side of the nave and chapel's shared wall, right here. So here's the chapel, so it's up above there. Directly below the upper church's earlier fresco of St. Francis offering his mantle to a poor knight, right there, on the inner side of the nave wall. While possibly a coincidence, 
The awkwardness of its placement within the Magdalene Chapel's narrative suggests its location may have been manipulated in order to stand in that particularly resonant position immediately below Francis' scene. Entering the chapel from the nave, viewers, or, or from the adjacent chapel, either way, viewers move easily left to right along the lower register of the first scene west wall, with the Magdalene's conversion at the house of Simon and the raising of Lazarus, and then continue <coughs> left to right for the Nole Mentandre and the voyage to Marseille on the opposite wall. But then, instead of continuing turning from left to right, and so moving to the south wall, viewers need first to look above the two scenes on the east wall to the single fresco of Mary Magdalene elevated by angels, before then continuing along the top register to the south wall's only narrative with the hermit priest, and finally returning to the first wall for the concluding last communion and elevation of the Magdalene soul into heaven. Go back to the first wall. A desire to locate the two scenes of gifting clothing in as close vertical proximity as possible may have influenced this not fully fluid reading of the Magdalene's narrative. Franciscan attention to the charitable gifting of garments appears elsewhere in the double church. The allegory of poverty is one of three Franciscan allegories frescoed in the lower church's crossing vaults, approximately contemporaneously with the Magdalene Chapel and Martin Chapel. Gifting of garments occurs twice there. A young man at the lower left exemplifies caritas by removing his outer mantle and giving it to a poor, older man in rich clothing. While above, an angel carries what may be that same garment, along with a bag of money, up to a heavenly figure. There the boy is, and then above, the angel carries the garment. Further, at the center of the fresco, Christ is shown marrying Francis to poverty. She appears there in a heavily, heavily patched garment, reminiscent of Francis's own heavily man, mended tunic, a relic kept at San Francesco and shown to pilgrims in the 14th century. Clearly, this theme of clothing the naked, one of the seven works of mercy from Matthew chapter 25, pervades the double churches of San Francesco and the Magdalene's naked body now participates in it. Dress and undress play additional roles at San Francesco. For clothing's rejection symbolizes the abandonment of worldly values in favor of spiritual ones for both Francis and the Magdalene. In both the lower and upper churches appear frescoes of St. Francis's renunciation of his inheritance. These represent Francis's determination to voluntarily return all his worldly property to his earthly father, a wealthy cloth merchant, and accept his heavenly father. In both, the Bishop of Assisi uses his own cloak to cover the naked Francis, who, as Bonaventure reported, quote, immediately took off all his clothes and restored them to his father, and cast aside even his breeches and made himself naked in the presence of all. In the lower church, this theme of voluntary nakedness gains prominence where Christ's stripping under the cross appears on the north wall of the nave, directly opposite Francis's on the south. And that's badly damaged today, but here's part of the scene of Christ's uh, stripping, voluntary stripping. Francis' spiritual transformation is thus initially expressed via images of undress. The new dress Francis dons post-conversion also affirms visually his spiritual transformation. Following his discarding of his well-to-do worldly dress, Francis, with rare exception, appears through the rest of the nave cycle and throughout San Francesco with head tonsure and wearing Franciscan dress, 
a modest put in habit with a knotted cord. Like Francis, the Magdalene experiences both a spiritual and sartorial transformation when she renounces her wealthy, worldly existence and lives as a wilderness penitent. That renunciation is also expressed most eloquently through dress. In her chapel's three pre-wilderness scenes in the lower register, her conversion, the raising of Lazarus, and the Nolle de Tangere, she wears her typically bright red robes with gold patterned edging, except when wiping Christ's feet at her conversion, her hair is up, arranged tidily, and veiled. While her rich red garment recalls caritas and Christ's passion, it also contrasts Franciscan garb and reminds viewers she was, quote, well-born, descended of royal stock, as Jacobus de Voragine reports. He adds, Magdalene then was very rich. In the wilderness, she abandons not only her prostitute's life of sensuous pleasure, but, like Francis, abandons her affluent upbringing. Quote again from the Golden Legend, after Christ's ascension, however, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus sold their possessions and laid the proceeds at the feet of the apostles. Following her journey in a rudderless boat to Marseille, now dressed in plain, pale red garb, she passes 30 years in the wilderness. There, Angels lift her daily at the seven canonical hours to feed her, quote, not with earthly viands, but only with the good things of heaven. She needed no material nourishment. The first of the two wilderness fresco narratives of Assisi, her elevation, emphasizes her Francis like renunciation of worldly values by highlighting her nudity. Only her long, now unbound tresses cover her clearly naked body. In this ascetic state of undress, she completes 30 years of contemplative penance, her sacrifice paralleling St. Francis's renunciation. In the following scene, a tonsured hermit stands before her cave, dressed in a brown hooded cloak over a brown garment, clearly evocative of a Franciscan habit, though he wears shoes, not sandals and no base cord is visible. In an allusion to monastic investiture, when Franciscan initiates first renounce their worldly possessions and take the habit, he reclothes the Magdalene, offering the bare-breasted, long-haired saint a faded red garment lacking gold trim. More visible at her reappearance in the final fresco, where she kneels before Bishop Maximum as he administers her the viaticum, then angels bear her soul into heaven. This modest and undecorated garb again replaces the bright red ornamented garment from her pre-wilderness scenes below. Here, her hair is carefully controlled and tightly bound. In the final episode, when her soul is raised by four angels, she, like them, appears in pure white, her hair again bound and now capped triumphantly with a pointed golden crown. A little hard to see, but you can just make out her pointed crown there. And as she and the angels look to the bust-length Christ on the ceiling vault above, the lowly penitent has obtained salvation and her altered dress, hair, and crown show her elevated state. However, the Magdalene's nakedness differs from Francis's in his renunciation, and from male nudity at San Francesco more generally. Francis's nudity and, uh, has positive implications when he renounces his inheritance and strips naked. Bonaventure's account does not suggest any shame attached to his state of undress, and Donal Cooper and Janet Robeson quote from Henri Gavranche's early 20, uh, 1230s versified life of Francis to demonstrate the contrast between Francis's nudity and Adam's at the fall. Quote, 
Francis suffers freely what Adam was forced to endure. He suffers by merit what Adam endured for sin, end quote. Male nudity at San Francesco, not extensive, but more frequent than female, expresses a range of generally positive ideas, including innocence, purity, heroic martyrdom, along with Christ-like humiliation and suffering, but only rarely shame. Perhaps most significantly, undress at San Francesco often confirms the figure's Christ-like nature, with a partially nude figure appearing most often throughout the double churches is Christ himself. Partially or fully nude females appear extremely rarely in 13th and 14th century imagery at San Francesco. As is commonly true in medieval and Renaissance European art, their bodies elicit different issues than male nudes. And even undressed holy women can raise questions concerning sin and the dangers of female sexuality. Of the extant imagery at San Francesco prior to 1319, the Magdalene Chapel's generally accepted terminus antiquum, all partial or full female nudity directly relates to the Magdalene, with the exceptions of images of the allegorical figure of poverty, which we already saw, and those of Eve, whose archetypal nudity shifts, shifts from innocence to shame. The remaining pre-1319 examples of full or partial female undress at San Francesco appear in the Magdalene Chapel on three different women and in the nearby Nicholas Chapel on the Magdalene herself. Their multivalent meanings simultaneously suggest both positive and negative qualities. We have already noted positive symbolism for Mary Magdalene's nakedness and exposed hair when she renounces the world and desires penitential cleansing. The reformed prostitute Mary of Egypt on the chapel's north wall, here at the center, similarly demonstrates those qualities by a long hair and partial undress, as does the naked, long-haired, penitent Magdalene in the nearby Nicholas Chapel, standing before her cave at the far right. More unusually, partial undress in the Magdalene Chapel extends there to a third woman, who appears in the East Wall's voyage to Marseille with miracle of the governor's family. She is the governor's wife, who dies during a pilgrimage and is abandoned on an island with her newborn son. There, she miraculously breastfeeds him for two years before being resurrected through the Magdalene's power, an episode likely appealing to the Assisi pilgrims. Her pale breast, when she cradles in her pale hand, protrudes prominently from her bright red gown, its nipple clearly silhouetted. This seems a curious detail in a church with so little focus on female undress, but especially because Maria Lactan's imagery, breastfeeding Mary imagery, was not yet widespread in the opening decade of the Trecento. The breast may suggest the nutritive powers of both motherhood and the Magdalene's miracle, reiterating the saint's alignment with birth and rebirth and her attentiveness to need pilgrims. But instances of the Magdalene's penitential, Eve-like nudity also remind viewers of the saint's sordid past as a prostitute, a past in which artists at San Francesco seem unusually interested. In the Magdalene Chapel, the saint appears as undressed hermit four times, twice in the frescoes and twice in stained glass. In Mary Magdalene, elevated by angels, she is veiled only by her luxuriously long blonde hair. It hangs down her side and opens along her right thigh, offering a long glimpse of flesh and revealing her right arm up to her shoulder. Unlike proper women's hair, hers is unruly and unbound. 
Thus, while her protective hair represents her renunciation of worldliness in favor of contemplation, its very exposure makes it an equivocal covering at best. As Roberta Milliken notes, the Magdalene's hair can never be seen as unambiguously penitential. It always carries hints of vanity and sexuality. Here, it recalls her earlier life as a prostitute, even while simultaneously signifying her rejection of that worldly existence. The frescoed hermit priest giving a garment reveals even more erotic flesh and enticements. For the Magdalene's bare breasts peek through this young, beautiful saint's fashionably long blonde hair. Even the abbreviated imagery in the chapel's stained glass cycle reveals an alluring Magdalene. While the wilderness Magdalene images there expose only her feet, lower arms, hands, and face, her sinuously serpentine golden hair envelops her sinuous body, sensuous body. In the St. Nicholas Chapel fresco nearby, she appears again with bare arms and bare lower legs and only luxurious blonde hair covering her torso. Martha East Easton's incisive observation regarding semi-nude bodies in the Lemberg brothers' Melzerre applies here as well. Quote, flowing hair substitutes for clothing to evoke the nude body that it ostensibly conceals, end quote. Clearly, San Francesco manifests exceptional interest in the Magdalene's penitential hermit, a theme consistent with Franciscan interest in hermitage, retreats, penitence, and renunciation. Yet, these depictions unusually emphasize her errant sensuality and greedy sinfulness. Significantly, such sensually appealing images seem absent from the Magdalene's 13th century French stained glass cycles and from the Italian cycles that precede the Assisi Chapel. For example, the earlier Magdalene Masters panel, with multiple scenes of the long hair and undressed saint in the wilderness, rigidly encloses and covers the saint in her protective hair. No hint of a sensual body here. The CC Chapel's instances of erotic nakedness and partial undress, when new, were peculiar to San Francesco and surely were striking, even perhaps shocking, to Trecento audiences. They apparently initiate a series of erotic depictions of the saints, for following these images, suggestive views of her as penitent continue into the Renaissance and well beyond. <clears throat> And I was quite struck with the similarity here with the much later Titian. <clears throat> I suggest the attention to the Magdalene's sensual body reconfirms the ambiguous nature of this saint as both a terrible sinner and a virtuous model. Indeed, a possible explanation for the eroticism of her CC imagery lies in the Magdalene cult's encouragement of ordinary sinners to identify with this less than perfect saint. For many, such modeling would represent a more realistically attainable goal than the unreachable Virgin Mary. Thus, these scenes necessarily offer conflicting meanings, ones that both model her virtuous characteristics and recall her pre-conversion life as a sinner. The first scene of her narrative her conversion at the house of Simon demonstrates this when it represents her famous act of virtuous charity. Motivated by love of God, she anoints Christ's feet with tears and ointment and wipes them with her hair. But this same conversion scene includes another innovation that demonstrates how the Magdalene's penitential neediness results in spiritual power and victory over sin. In so doing, it again parallels episodes in Francis's Vita, although once again reversing the active-passive roles, and it relies upon her sinful nature. 
overlooked until recently the presumably originally seven demons Christ exercised from Mary Magdalene during her, exorcism, uh, during her conversion appear in the void at the fresco's far left. Hard to see, I'll show you in detail in a moment, right over here. While barely visible today, again, you can see part of the foot and wing of some of the demons um, as they took off. While barely visible today due to both paint losses and their positioning against the dark blue sky, the Magdalene's demons exit her penitent, submissive body and fly off the fresco to our left. Their presence recalls the Magdalene's pre-conversion life as a prostitute and also works compositionally to explain what several scholars have judged a pictorial imbalance created by the kneeling saint's positioning and the seemingly blank blue sky at the far left. But even with the devil's presence acknowledged, the composition remains lopsided. By comparison, Giovanni da Milano's Rinicini Chapel conversion, influenced by the Assisi prototype, centers the kneeling saint below the table while devils fly out from the roof directly above her here. A much more harmonious arrangement than at Assisi. This Assisi fresco is notable as it remains the first Italian image known to me of the Magdalene at Simon the Pharisee's house that incorporates escaping devils. Further, it again suggests ties to northern imagery. As Adelaide Bennett has shown, examples of German and English art predate it. I believe the decision to introduce demons somewhat awkwardly behind the saint emphasizes the saint's abject neediness and, more importantly, locates her here and now in this specific Franciscan setting. The awkward arrangement allows the demons to exit the Magdalene's body behind her, out the chapel's entryway towards the lower church's high altar. So that fresco's on this wall, the figure's right here, and the demons go towards the altar. This is significant because that altar was the site of multiple posthumous exorcisms attributed to St. Francis. The Magdalene's conversion thus aligns with his exorcisms. A visual tradition for representing Francis' spiritual cures, where the affliction exited in the form of one or more devils, was already well established in the saint's imagery by the Trecento. Exorcisms appear on the earliest dated panel of St. Francis by Bonaventura Berlinghieri. As you can see in the scene here, you make out devils exiting. And visitors to the upper church would see Francis exorcising seven demons from Arezzo. You see them up here. A scene that resonates with Christ's exorcism of the Magdalene in her chapel below. Most significantly, this panel of St. Francis, still located at San Francesco and likely made for the lower church high altar, records Francis's posthumous exorcism of the girl from Norsha. A devil exits her open mouth. Here, I'm sorry this is such poor quality, but there's the devil exiting her mouth. This event took place at this very altar in the lower church. The ultimate goal of the penitential pilgrims, of course, was to visit that very altar with Francis's tomb just below it. Circulating through the Magdalene Chapel before entering the north transept and approaching the tomb, pilgrims would see the Magdalene's conversion and be reminded of Francis's posthumous exorcisms at the nearby altar. This allowed worshipers to hope that they like the once terrible sinner Mary Magdalene, would be saved at Francis' tomb. While the Magdalene's exorcism in the conversion at the House of Simon exemplifies exactly such a transformation, 
it also, again, places the saint in a submissive posture within the narrative, unlike the active behaviors of Christ or Francis. The Magdalene models hope and conversion, yet she retains the posture of the passive, in need of a cure sinner, unlike the upright, miracle-working God or saint. But the Magdalene's gender, as understood through stereotyped notions regarding female inferiority, pertains in perhaps unanticipated ways. On the one hand, it demonstrates her natural weaknesses. Like ordinary women, she is submissive and needy, passive while men are active. Yet her defective female nature is simultaneously a source of her power for her lay audience, for she is saved. We see that directly above the conversion when she elevates into heaven, triumphantly crowned and in white. While it was far more common for women to be exorcised than men, suggesting their more sinfully uh, vulnerable, leaky, and passive natures, the Magdalene's remarkable cure invokes the totals of hope. If even she can be cleansed, then so can I. In this way, the Magdalene joins the ranks of the worst lay sinners, a passive vessel of sensual corruption, yet a deity both active and compassionate empties her of sin. The three scenes following her exorcism and conversion the raising of Lazarus, Noah de Tangere, and Voyage to Marseille, continue this ambivalent view of the saint, who constantly requires assistance, yet is miraculously rewarded. As at her conversion, she appears prominently as the needy, uh, as at her conversion, sorry, she appears prominently as the needy supplicant rather than the miracle worker. Yet her successes at petitioning Christ emphasize her power as intercessor. Following her tearful request, Christ miraculously resurrects her brother. While in the Nole Me Tangere, Christ does not allow her to touch him, he honors her by allowing her to be the first to witness him as the risen Christ. And adrift with her companions in a rudderless boat, her prayers are answered by angels who safely pull them to Marseille. The only reference to the Magdalene's own miraculous deeds in the chapel appear in the lower part of this last episode, depicting the later event involving the Marseille governor's deceased wife and child on the island. But the saint's intervention is de-emphasized, due both to her absence from that later episode and the moment shown in the fresco, the wife has not yet been revived. Indeed, in the chapel's fresco cycle, the Magdalene appears in a lowered body posture of supplication, either near to the ground or on her knees in all seven narratives. Even in the stained glass, where the narrow vertical panels discourage compositions with horizontally posed figures, and the saint is sometimes standing, she can still be seen beseeching assistance in almost every narrative. You see her here, and here, and here with her arms crossed, and here, and it goes on. Thus, she consistently models the needy, penitent petitioner, but one whose prayers are answered as she repeatedly reconfirms her role as powerful intercessor. She appears to lack agency, yet succeeds. Always the sensuous sinner, she is finally fully redeemed. Garbed in pure white and gloriously crowned, her soul is raised triumphantly to heaven. Mary Magdalene appears standing upright only once in the chapel's frescoes when the donor, Teobaldo Pontano, instead assumes her typical kneeling posture and petitions her by taking her hand and gazing up at her face. This fresco resonates with the narratives immediately above, and in doing so, reaffirms the Magdalene's penitent, uh, potent role as intercessor. 
In the Nole Me Tantere, directly above, she kneels while reaching out, unable to touch the transfigured Christ. Spiritual love here replaces physical love. In the uppermost fresco, she humbly kneels while ascending to accept celestial, not material fare, confirming her successful transition from the physical to the spiritual realm. Returning below, we see the upright Mary Magdalene, who in contrast accepts Pantano's hand and returns his gaze. She positions herself as, inter as worthy saint, but one on a highly accessible, even touchable level, functioning as intercessor par excellence to the celestial realm, she remains a true intermediary between earth and heaven, as confirmed in the frescoes above. Visiting pilgrims could, in turn, model themselves on Teobaldo, kneeling and petitioning this very human and approachable saint. The Magdalene remains thus greatly honored at San Francesco. Yet the Magdalene's position there remains equivocal. Her Im images resonate throughout the upper and lower churches. Imaginatively relocating the site of her exorcism and conversion to San Francesco itself, near Francis's tomb, aligns Christ's biblical narrative with Francis's posthumous ones and reassures pilgrims of the shrine's efficacy. As a New Testament saint, she illogically appears as a model for the 13th century Saint Francis. However, Francis's vita also anachronistically transforms her life, inspiring new narrative episodes, her receipt of the garment, and reshaping established scenes, as when demons fly from her submissive body and her conversion. Despite her prominence, she consistently appears needy, a passive recipient of charity and miraculous works, rather than a miracle worker. As a female, she carries the taint of sexual sin through her exposed and eroticized body. Thus, she needs to be clothed, as elsewhere at San Francesco, destitute individuals are closed by Saints Francis and Martin. A terrible sinner, she is exorcised by Christ, as Saint Francis posthumously exorcises pilgrims visiting <coughs> his nearby tomb. The Assisi Chapel thus presents a lowly and submissive Magdalene, who successfully models renunciation, penitence, and caritas values important to the Franciscans. The Magdalene remains very much an imperfect human, yet her power as intercessor <coughs> goes unchallenged. It is the depth of her very apparent weaknesses that offer audiences hope. If she can be saved, so can they. Thank you.